I am so happy um, to have with us today um, Dr. Amber Schlimmer. I don't know what's wrong with my tongue today, Amber, but I'm trying. Um, Amber is from Michigan, this great state. She was born and raised in Flushing, Michigan, and she um, provides services to um, people in Genesee County um, through her business called Primary Prevention Physiotherapy. Um, Amber is very passionate about fitness and helping others achieve a healthier, more active lifestyle. Uh, she has a bachelor's in kinesiology and she has a doctorate in physical therapy. And she's also a former personal trainer, nutritional consultant and certified strength and conditioning coach. Can I hire you, Amber, for that? I am available. Uh, Mesa members, welcome Dr. Amber. She's going to give us some information about the six fundamental movement patterns. Thank okay. you so much, Amber. Thank you for having me. Let me just go ahead and get my screen shared with everybody here. Everyone can see that, I hope. Well, good morning, friends. And now that we're a little less stressed, thanks to Heidi, what great information she presented to all of us. Uh, I'm Dr. Amber Schlemmer, and I'm a physical therapist and owner of Primary Prevention Physiotherapy in Benton and Flushing, Michigan. Uh, I am a passionate enthusiast of health and human movement, and today I plan to help you understand that your health is within your control. Through proper movement, nutrition, and lifestyle modification, you can develop a health and vitality that lasts a lifetime. And the best part is we're going to simplify the process. So before we get rolling, I'd love for each of you to send me one thing that you hope to learn or take from today as it relates to exercise. I'll give you a couple seconds to do so. All right. Thank you. So this is my amazing family. This is my husband, Eric, my son, Bodie, and my daughter, Lily. And this is my why. As you'll find on your interactive worksheet, finding your why, as Simon Sinek has so successfully taught us, uh, can be one of the most effective motivational tools to continue and improve uh, your, and maintain your health habits. And as we learned last year from last year's presenter, our why gives us purpose. This here is my multifaceted team of healers. Uh, Primary Prevention was built to be a one-stop shop for all things health and healing. Uh, we have a wonderful rehab team, including chronic pain management, pelvic health, concussion management, amputee and spinal cord care, dry needling and massage. Our performance division continues the pursuit of health in the form of individualized coaching, both remote and on site. Uh, group fitness classes, yoga, all kinds of amazing things. Uh, our goal is to help give each of our friends the tools and direction they need to maximize their own health. Hence the triple P Venn diagram symbolism there. The three circles in our logo represent movement, nutrition, and mindfulness. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? I think that's the theme of today's entire conference, as a matter of fact. As we know, when those three things are fine-tuned and become long-term habits, that coveted inner circle is found, that true and optimal health. And this is why we love Mesa so very much. I hope every single member that's listening today recognizes how very lucky you are to have it. Uh, I'm sure you've heard from family members that not all insurances are as easy to work with. They don't always put the health of their members uh, first, nor are they leading the way in providing coverage for prevention-based medicine without red tape and hoops to jump through like Mesa is. We want to thank the leaders and employees at Mesa for demonstrating how healthcare should work, not only for you, the members, but for us, the providers as well. So thank you, Mesa. Now, our job as physical therapists is to help patients restore function, mobility, and strength. And at Primary Prevention, we take it a few steps further. We not only treat the pain or the dysfunction using movement as medicine, but we utilize our time with patients to attempt to improve their nutrition, their sleep habits, their attitudes of gratitude or positivity. Uh, because what good is fixing their knee if the patient's gonna go right back to drinking pop and sitting on the couch eating Oreos, right? So we try to make a healthy impression on every single patient. 
And the reason I'm so passionate about human, the human body is because of its amazing capacity and resiliency. Our body is literally a healing machine when given the right environment. So if this is the case, then why is our country so unhealthy? We know now all disease and degenerative states result from an underlying state of inflammation. The root causes of inflammation, as Heidi discussed, come from food, stress, poor sleep, nutritional deficiencies, and or environmental toxins like plastics. While the level at which we can control each of these varies, the truth is that we do have control over them. Living in America, most consume the standard American diet, which I'd like to point out owns the acronym SAD filled with chips, cookies, crackers, soda, bread, seed oils, and foods of convenience or fast foods. If you participate in less than the recommended amount of physical activity per week, which is 300 minutes, whoop, there we go, 150 to 300 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous activity, which breaks down to just 20 to 40 minutes per day, if we're not doing those two things, if we're consuming standard American diet and not moving our body at least this amount, we're literally asking for chronic disease. Our foods can be healthful and life promoting or the slowest form of poison. Let this sink in for just a second. Signs of atherosclerosis or problematic plaque lining the arteries is present in over 50% of our 10 year old children. Childhood obesity rates have skyrocketed and I won't even mention the adult obesity rates. One of my favorite physicians, cardiologist, Dr. Estelston from the Cleveland Clinic uh, had a brilliant quote. He said, some people, move on here, there we go. Some people think that diets and exercise are extreme, that eating whole foods are extreme. Over half a million people this year will have their chests open up and a vein taken from their leg and sewn into their coronary artery. Some people might call that extreme. Just depends on your level of extreme, right? So what do we do about it? And how does physical therapy fit into all of this? Well, as Heidi just mentioned again, uh, exercise is pretty amazing, both for the body and for the brain. PTs are referred to in the medical world as the movement experts. And just like you would never go to a dentist with bad teeth or a, hair, a hairstylist with bad hair, all physical therapists should be consistently practicing what they preach as well. Also, we went to school for way too long to tell you the green band's too easy. Okay, here you go. Let's move on to the blue band. <laughs> Our bodies, even in healing and rehabilitation, are capable of so much more than that. Working one-on-one -on -one with patients allows us at Primary Prevention not only uh, allows us to not only plant seeds of change, but to water them and foster their growth. We lay groundwork to help each patient find uh, their confidence back with day-to-day -day movements. And then we continue to push each patient to reach a level of fitness uh, that they can keep up with. After therapy, each patient is offered either a group fitness membership or a personal training package to continue their progress. It's a never ending cycle of wellness. This is why our shirts, our walls, our branding all center around a mantra. That mantra is movement is medicine. We live it, we breathe it. And we try to demonstrate to each of our patients just how different their lives could be if they only adopted this mantra along with food as fuel. Our strength coach, Andrew Cataldo, said it best when he said, at first glance, you may think me saying movement as medicine is just a catchy way to motivate you to work out more. But what if I told you that for the most common diseases and disorders, exercise is shown to be more effective than medication alone? Now, this doesn't mean stop taking your medications. Let me preface with that. Continue taking your medications, but we're gonna add exercise, okay? To say that individualized movement, nutrition, and lifestyle prescription are enough to improve most disease states is a bold statement. However, there is a robust body of literature showing that management of diseases like anxiety, depression, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and pain management, just to name a few, Exercise and nutrition have better long-term outcomes than any pharmaceutical on the market. But we often search for quick and simple fixes to our conditions, which is why the line for medications and surgery will always be longer than that of lifestyle change. And with low back pain and neck pain resulting in the largest reason for disability in America, the number one reason that employees have to call off, 
maybe, just maybe, uh, this is more of a movement problem and less of a medical problem. In my experience as a physical therapist, appropriate but progressive movement has solved the issue far more times than pain medicines. And the only side effects to exercise are increased happiness, a rocking and stronger body, and the ability to do more throughout your day. Humans have been roaming this earth with nothing more than nature, far longer than they've been suppressed by some modern medicines, food products, and lifestyles, or as I like to call them, modern conveniences. When humans used to hunt, forage, and chase their food sources, they had to farm and build and create. Humans are designed to move a lot, yet we now sit at desks for eight hours. Modern life has become too easy, making movement non-essential to survival. Although, is our only purpose on earth to survive? Movement has become something most weight to make a priority until they acquire increased body fat, they develop pain, dysfunction, injury, or some disease that you know their doctors tell them exercise will fix. Movement used to be the only way humans thrived. Now, compared to our ancestors, our physical exercise is not performed in an effort to keep ourselves or our families alive, fed, sheltered, and safe. Our physical exercise looks much different and usually takes place in a gym or a fitness facility. But get this, 4.9% of the current US population has a gym membership and actually uses it. 4.9%. So if you're included in this 4.9%, give yourself a pat on the back. But let's unpack this a little bit. I wanna ask you guys, so I wanna see some comments start rolling in here. What keeps you or has kept you out of the gym? Give you a few seconds to respond there. So the three biggest answers, thank you for your responses, are typically time, I don't have enough of it. I don't know what to do when I get to the gym or not feeling comfortable enough to be around those who are more familiar with the gym. This might imply that we might lack the confidence or competence to be consistent with working out. Enter the three C's of fitness. My job today is to give you the competence or the information for you to become more confident with your strength routine so that you can become consistent. No amount of competence or confidence can trump consistency, making it the most important C. Consistency with movement leads to consistency with good food choices because you don't want to blow all your hard work that you just did at the gym. <laughs> and then consistency uh, with food creates better sleep habits because in order to perform at our best, sleep's crucial, all of which lead to more and more health-promoting behaviors. Do you see this other cycle here? So now some of you may have said, I don't go to the gym because it hurts. So here are my recommendations for those friends. Number one, if it moves, it makes noise. And just like a creaky door hinge, sometimes our joints just need a little lubrication. The best way to get that lubrication, because the last I checked, intravenous WD-40 is still very, very dangerous, uh, is full range loaded movements, full range loaded exercise. So unless the click pop or noise is painful with every rep, it's likely, likely nothing to be concerned about and may eventually go away. If it bothers you, get in to see a PT. Number two, perform movements at a tolerable range of motion for you. If today you can only get down to thighs parallel with the ground in your squat before knee pain, perfect, that's where we start. And then we want you to consistently reach for more pain-free motion. Uh, even if it's only one millimeter at a time with each rep, you'll likely be surprised to find out that soon the pain is no more. And number three, get into a fitness forward PT like PPP, where we can help you learn what your body is trying to tell you and how to change it. And yes, we do have telehealth options. So no matter where you are in Michigan, you have access to the best PT team around. <laughs> PT is also a great place to begin your exercise consistency. And you don't have to have pain or dysfunction either, uh, but pain is an easy entry to PT. We can also see patients for things like hypertension, uh, diabetes, obesity, and even impaired balance. 
All of these chronic lifestyle conditions are best treated with movement and nutrition, but there's an expert uh, for that next. <laughs> so now let's start to work on some of that competence. The fitness industry has become saturated with experts, leaving you, the consumer, unsure what program to do or to follow. So today I want to simplify those, uh, those movements into six fundamental movement patterns to allow you the opportunity to get started. Number one, at no cost, because we're going to find equipment right around our home to help minimize excuses and maximize our own health. I hope everyone brought their water bottles and their gym clothes because we're going to get ready to do some work. Now, if you have to shut your camera off for this, I totally understand, but I would love to see some, some participation here. Uh, so what we'll do is I will explain each of the six fundamental movement patterns. I'll demonstrate how this movement is applicable in life. And then we're going to practice the movements together. So we'll start with the most basic form of the movement, and then I'll give you one to two variations, okay? But first, let's talk about how to progress these movements. So number one, <clears throat> you can always build in weight or repetitions. Each and every time you hit the gym, the idea should be to add in repetitions and or weight to ensure that progressive overload is what we call it. Typically, the heavier the load, the lower the reps before you reach uh, failure and vice versa. Now, the operative word in that sentence was failure. This is the only place where failure is actually a success. <laughs> if you set out to do eight repetitions, you shouldn't be able to get the ninth. And if you can, it's probably time to either add some more weight or complete the set to true failure, uh, where either your form starts to decline or you're nervous that you might not get that next rep. And that's the same for all rep schemes. And let's not get bogged down between the six to eight reps versus the 15 to 20 repetitions, because for each of them, as long as they're performed to failure, they've been uh, shown to demonstrate increases in muscle mass, improvements in cardiovascular capacity, and neurological and biological adaptations that can make us happier, smarter, and more resilient. Number two, you can add time to your movement and perform it more slowly. You'll thank me for this one later, I promise. Each movement when performed normally should be done with precision and effort. Now, if you add time to that equation, you'll get yourself one heck of a workout. I'll give some examples as we work through some of our movements as well. Number three, you can take away an arm or a leg. <laughs> Once exercises become too easy, attempt the same movement if possible uh, with only one side of your body and then repeat on the other side. To clean up any significant muscle imbalances or persistent pain, I, uh, I definitely recommend working with a qualified strength coach like Andrew. Andrew utilizes an app that allows him to remotely program each single, every single workout for each of his patients, no matter where they live. Uh, the programs are individualized and monitored with compliance scores and weekly check-ins. Working with a trusted and ridiculously knowledgeable strength coach to me is a non-negotiable. Uh, I have a darn doctorate in human movement, and I still continue to pay a coach to program for me. Can you guess why? Because when I have someone staring at me or when I have to click a box that, that lets him know that I've completed my exercise, it's weird, it makes me do it. It eliminates my excuses. And let me tell you how much we could all use an Andrew. <laughs> uh, last but not least, keep it simple. Uh, because while the flash of a new shiny piece of equipment, you know, chains, BOSU balls and these added bands uh, can be tempting and sometimes it can be useful. Uh, we wanna be able to do the simple things really, really well first. All right, so let's move. I want to implore that if your training is blatantly disregarding one of these core movements that I'm about to speak of, you're not only placing your results at risk, but you're also uh, your long-term orthopedic health and wellness. You're placing that at risk as well. Simply put, no program is complete without training each and every one of these patterns. Notice that I'm not saying muscles, because muscles don't work in isolation, meaning when we lift our arm, sure, we emphasize a, a particular shoulder muscle, but think of the finely tuned orchestra uh, that's present with all the other muscles, ligaments, tendons, bones that are all coordinating to make that movement and motion possible. Strength and mobility are best trained in patterns, not particular muscles. So the six fundamental movement patterns are 
a squat, a bend or a hinge, an upper body push, upper body pulls, lunges, and carrying items. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you two minutes, okay? Two minutes, and this is gonna serve as our warm up. The warm up is gonna be sprinting around your house or whatever setting you're in. If you're at work, I understand if you can't participate. <laughs> um, this is a great way to get a worksite wellness uh, uh, discussion invigorated anyway. Um, we're gonna sprint around the house and try to find some of these items, okay? Now, you don't have to find each of them and hold on, stay with me for just a second here because I'll start the timer. But what I really want you to find, if you have kettlebells and dumbbells, that's great. Um, but if not, you can grab two soup cans or two water bottles. Um, I want everybody to grab a backpack or an over the shoulder bag, uh, like a strong grocery bag or just a, you know, your work bag. I'm going to have you grab a few heavy books so we can put those in the backpack. And then I'd like you to find either a laundry detergent container or a kitty litter container if you have that. Um, at work, you're going to have to be a little bit more uh, strategic with what you're finding around, but find something heavy around you that you can hold on to. And then last but not least, I want everybody to grab either a broomstick or a dowel. All right, the timer will start. to finalize those last little selections here. everybody has their items and I hope the screen catches your eye. So what will happen is as we go over each of our movements here, the movement on the left, Andrew is going to uh, uh, demonstrate for us. And then on the right in each of these slides, you'll find the real life application and how this applies to what we're doing every single day. Okay. So our first fundamental movement is a squat. We've all seen this. Squats are literally the king of all movement patterns, sitting down and standing back up. Every human squats at least 20 times a day, likely more. And this is one of the most important and necessary life skills that we sometimes take for granted until it's too late. Squatting is not bad for the knees or the hips. And if anything, squatting has demonstrated improvements in ligamentous strength, muscular strength, and osteoarthritis related pain in the knees. So real life application, you guys all saw uh, our brand manager here quote Cody. <laughs> sit down and stand up. Is that not one of the most functional movements we do throughout the day? So let's all take some time and practice. I'm going to move my chair back a little bit. 
if you're new to fitness, I encourage you to use a chair for this, preferably a chair that doesn't move or have wheels on it. Um, so the first movement we're going to practice is actually a chair squat or a sit to stand. So I'm going to move this back here so you can see what I'm doing. All we're going to do is we're going to practice 10 together. I want you to stand up out of your, your chair and then we're going to sit back down nice and lightly. Everyone to practice 10 of these. Now, if you're having trouble controlling the last little bit of depth here before you sit down, this is an appropriate place to work. Oh, sorry. Okay. I think it's for screen. Let's see here. Can you see me now? Oh. I see what's going on here. That's okay. You guys don't need to see me. I'm going to let you follow along with what, um, with what Anders is doing here. So you're basically going to do exactly what Anders is doing. You're just sitting down onto a chair and then standing back up. Okay. So we're going to practice that one 10 times. Now that everyone's gone through that, we're gonna practice exactly what Andrew is doing. And you don't have to grab a weight just quite yet. These are called air squats. So what I want you to do is exactly like Andrew's doing, you're just gonna squat down. If you can't get down as far as Andrew, that's okay. Remember what I said earlier about um, uh, your range of motion, going to your tolerable range of motion that doesn't cause pain. So now let's practice 10 of those air squats like Andrew. So now this one, as you're practicing these 10, I'm going to talk you through this. Um, this one would be a really great one to add in some time to. So uh, a lot of the times at the clinic, I will have patients uh, take about two to three seconds on their descent going down nice and slow, hold at the bottom of their squat for two to three seconds, and then come up with some power. So feel free and give those, those repetitions a couple tries as well. Can you see the difference? So now lastly, the goblet squat, this is exactly what Andrew is demonstrating over here. So now what I'd like you to do is go ahead and grab that, um, that laundry detergent container or grab a couple of those heavy books. And all you're gonna do is hold them right at your chest like Andrew is, just try not to breathe in that laundry detergent too much. <laughs> and let's do 10 more with a little bit of load. And I want you to see how it kind of uh, encourages you to keep your chest nice and upright. Now, a couple cues that I use on um, squats, go ahead and practice your 10 with your weight. So we're gonna do that goblet squat and I want you to practice 10 there. Um, a couple cues that I give, if you're getting any pinching in your hips, take your feet just a little bit wider and I want you to really focus on pushing your knees out. They don't actually go anywhere, but use the muscles that you would use to push those knees out. Um, weight in this movement goes back in your heels but toes stay in contact with the ground. So in this one, if you feel like you're gonna fall backwards, you're doing it right. <laughs> Don't actually fall though, please. Um, especially if you're uh, experiencing pain in your knees, that posterior weight shift can be a big advantage for you, okay? All right, so now everyone just practiced 30 squats. If you're participating, I appreciate you. You're gonna feel it tomorrow. All right, our next movement is the bend or the hinge. Now this one is a little bit different than a squat. So pay attention to Andrew. The bend or the hinge is also the king of all movements. And this is a progressive society, right? We can have two kings. Uh, one of the best exercises for your back and your core, the hip hinge maintains a stable trunk and lower body while moving through the hips. So think of a door hinge where the piece attached to the door is locked in and the part attached to the frame is, is rock solid. Dr. Amber. Yes. We have a question in the chat, um, and I've heard this too. I've, I've been corrected recently, though. Um, people are, are have been told, historically, we shouldn't extend our knees, extend past our knees when we do a squat. I think most people feel like it's dangerous to go down as low as Andrew in a squat. And can you comment to that? Can you answer or clear up any questions? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm happy that you brought that up because that's actually one of my cues. So here's the thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back just a little bit. So every time we walk downstairs, our knee traverses over our toes, right? 
So it's a functional movement that we have to be able to tolerate throughout our day-to-day -day process. So biomechanically speaking, knees over toes does not create any more stress on the knees, the ankles, or the hips, or even the low back um, than any other form of a squat. So if you get pain when your knees come over your toes, that's an indication that your body's probably just not in that position enough. It hasn't adapted to that position. So we actually have at the clinic a knees over toes protocol that we really try to encourage patients to start to build into because not only does it build really, really great ankle mobility, which can be a restricted place in most humans, but it also helps build the capacity of the knees in those friends with osteoarthritis or injuries throughout their knees. So uh, myth is what I will say. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, I, I think you did, but can you give alternatives for people who feel like they have issues with their knees? Should they just continue to squat where at the uh, height they can squat or are there some other things they should be doing? Absolutely. So there's always extra exercises that we can be doing that can help kind of facilitate the process to build into those movement patterns. But if you can't do a sit to stand, that's probably a good indication for some therapy. So uh, the, the most basic form of a squat pattern would be that sit to stand. So even if your surface is a little bit higher for right now, sit down on a, on a surface and then stand back up. That's where we start. Great, thank you. Sound good? Yes, absolutely. Keep those questions coming. I'm going to leave some um, time at the end as well for some questions. So if I happen to not see them, because I, you know, talk a million miles a minute, and I'm so excited about exercise here, uh, we will certainly address them at the end. Okay. <laughs> Keep them coming. Okay, so we're on to this bend and hinge. So remember, it, we're, we're talking about that that door hinge, right? We're kind of extending over uh, that hip. So some real life applications, let me continue looping this here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna start our friend Turk over here again, is picking up this laundry basket. Now he's combining two of our motions, our patterns. So he's deadlifting and then he's carrying that laundry basket. Very functional in day-to-day -day life, right? I can't tell you how many people that I've met that can't pick up that laundry basket. They can't get down to reach it, right? This is a really great skill to have. Um, I'm gonna play this one more time and see if you notice anything different about Turk. So Turk is one of our heroes around the clinic. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but as he walks here, that left leg is actually a prosthetic leg. He is a rock star, this one. All right, so now let's all practice our bending and hinging. And what I will say is this is one of the more difficult ones. This is the one that I spend a lot of time working with on patients, okay? So if you don't uh, progress past the first movement on this one, that's okay. That's okay. Your day will come. You just keep working on getting down and touching those toes, okay? So this is where that dowel uh, is gonna come into play. So I want everybody to grab their broomsticks. What you're gonna do is you're gonna place that broomstick right along your spine. So I'm gonna have you bring it up over your head. Your one hand is gonna go right back behind your head. And then the other hand is gonna go right at the base of your spine, like right over your, your sacrum or your hips. And what I want you to do is I want you to stand up nice and tall and I want you to connect the back of your head, the middle of your shoulder blades and your tailbone to that stick as you hold it back there. Okay, let me grab my dowel. Just in case you guys have me pinned up to the top of your screen there, okay? All right, so we're, we have our three points of contact. And now from here, my cue that I give most often for a hinge position is I want you to pretend like you're gonna turn around and shut your car door with your butt, okay? So you're just pushing your hips back like you're uh, shutting that car door, okay? And now as you go down, I want you to try to maintain all three points of contact with that broomstick. Your back stays nice and flat. You should get a nice little stretch out of the back of your legs. As you get down and you run out of hamstring length, that's where your knees can start to bend ever so slightly. Notice the difference between a squat and a deadlift is there was a lot more knee flexion or knee bend in the, the squat. Our chest stays up a little bit more upright in the squat where in a bend or a hinge, our chest can come down a little bit more parallel to the ground, okay? So I want everyone to practice about 12 of those hinges with your broomstick. And I'll give you a couple seconds to do that here. Now on this one, keep going as I talk. 
<clears throat> on this one, the weight distributes throughout your foot. You're not really gonna have a ton of weight in the back of your heel or too much weight in the front of your foot. This one should be right over the middle of your foot and your toes should still be able to grab the ground if you need to. All right, now that everyone's finishing up their 12, the next one we're gonna do is I want you to bring back that laundry detergent container, or you could also grab your backpack full of books for this one. So now on this deadlift, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of our broomstick. Our weight should be placed on the ground. When we perform a deadlift, the weight, just like Andrew's doing here, goes right between our toes. <clears throat> was right between our toes, centered equally through both feet. We're hinging through that hip complex. Our back stays nice and straight. Our knees can have a little bend. Right now, if this is your bend and you're able to come to knee height, that's beautiful. You should still feel a nice big stretch through your hamstrings. And you should feel those quads and glutes kind of getting a little spicy here. <laughs> I want you to go ahead and try about 10 of those. So whether you're coming from ground level or whether you need a little assistance and maybe to pop it up on something a little taller. Typically at the clinic, we'll, we'll have patients uh, deadlift down to a bench or a box. So look around you, see if you can find something strategic. If not, just measure based on maybe the height of your knees, okay? We'll go through about 10 of those. All right. All right, everyone feeling their legs warm up a little bit? Let's go over the, the upper body push pattern. I wanna make sure to get through all of these really, really well. Give you guys lots of practice with them. So the push pattern, pushes come in horizontal or vertical push patterns. The first movement that jumps to mind for the push or the bench press and the push up. And although they seem pretty simple on the surface, uh, they require a complex interplay of trunk stability, shoulder tension, and muscle coordination to even get you up off the floor for a push up. The tall plank should be mastered before attempting any other form of a push. And we're gonna go through three different planking variations. I'm gonna demonstrate them to you pretty quickly because a plank should be mastered before we start bending those elbows and going into a push up. So I'm gonna stop Andrew right here and let's talk about those planks. So a plank can be a tall plank with our arms straight out. A plank can be on our forearms and a plank can be modified. So in either of those two positions, probably arms straight, you could do this off the back of your couch or a desk if getting down to and up from the ground uh, seems a little troublesome for you, okay? So plank number one is gonna be a modified plank, okay? So what you're gonna do is you can either go down to your knees and you can take that same pl uh, plank position with your hands on the floor, or like I just said, you can use a countertop or your desk, okay? Hands go right on the countertop or desk. Feet are gonna walk about three steps behind you. And then what I want you to do is just shift your body weight up and over your hands, keeping your toes right where you originally put them back there, okay? So this is your modified plank. <clears throat> A tall plank is just like Andrew's doing right there. And you can do this in a, in a modified form with your knees down if you need to, um, or you can do it on your forearms as well. Either of those are perfectly acceptable, okay? So for right now, we're gonna take one minute and I want everybody to either get down onto the ground or get ready to do that modified version of the plank. And I want you to work on either uh, a tall plank or a forearm plank. And we're gonna see if we can hold it for one minute. And I wanna know who was able to hold it for one minute, okay? I don't have any fun timers with bombs at the end on this one. So go ahead and we'll come on up. And then I'm gonna start my timer here. And let's hope everybody's holding. Let's go guys, up and at them. We're holding right. them here, we're holding them here. Everyone's holding, is that what you said? Yeah, they're holding here. They're on, in their planks. Perfect. I'm, I'm glad everyone's uh, mics are muted because uh, right now we'd probably start to hear the heavy breathing, right? <laughs> All right, we're at 30 seconds. If you can keep uh, holding, 
Keep holding. If you need to come down, come on down. Keep pushing that shake. If you're shaking like crazy right now, you know, you're, you know, it's working. Uh, one of the best cues that I give throughout this plank position too, and I want you to try this is pretend like someone's holding a lighter under your belly button, draw those muscles in. Like you're trying to get away from that flame that helps, uh, helps you find that hollow position. And that's a minute. Well done, you guys. So that's your first plank position. Okay. Now from there, we can start to move into the actual push or the push up. Now, Andrew is doing a modified push up, which is perfect. Or if you have the capacity, let's go ahead and do a full push up. So we'll get back down onto the ground. Now, the biggest thing with this one is uh, that spine stays nice and rigid. So as you go down, your chest, your belly button, and your hips should all lower at the same time and they should all push up at the same time. So I like to say in one strong piece, right? Like that, that spine is just a rigid uh, a dowel again. So this time let's go down to the ground and we're gonna practice eight of those either modified or full push-ups, okay? And I'm gonna answer some questions while you guys are going through that. So um, I know one of the questions is gonna be, why does Andrew have his elbows so tight, right? Why are they uh, coming right next to his body here? So this is actually a scapular push-up, forgive me. You guys can go back and practice those later. He's just moving his shoulder blade side to side. So now this full push up, look how close his elbows are to his ribs. This is really, really great for your shoulder health. And while this might be a little bit more difficult, uh, that's okay. We want to maintain those nice, robust, bulletproof shoulders, right? And when we go out nice and wide, it kind of exploits the front of our shoulder joint, okay? All right, so hopefully everyone's gotten through their eight, either modified or full push ups. Next one is going to be our pull pattern. So again, this one comes in uh, push and pull patterns, horizontal and vertical, just like our, our pushes from before, okay? So now most people know about the pull-up, but a few people uh, incorporate horizontal pulls into their program. Both are important as they address different muscle recruitment. And I tend to do two pulls for every push simply because we live up here. So we tend to do a lot more pushing uh, than we get the opportunity to pull. So to prevent rounded shoulders, to combat poor posture, desk sitting, pulling can be very, very beneficial. So real life application, here's my friend Turk again. He's just pulling that door open. And that's a beautiful real life application of a pull here. But what about like helping somebody up off of the ground or pulling yourself up onto a dock or out of a pool, grabbing something off of a shelf, all very important. So our first exercise that we're gonna do, this is where a band will be very helpful if you have one. If not, that's okay. What I want you to do is I want you to, think about this for a second. I want you to push, perform this movement like you're moving through mud. Okay, like there's mud on all sides of you and you have to really resist that mud to get out of the way. So in this, in this particular exercise, what you're gonna do is you're gonna grab your band, hands go straight out in front of you. If you don't have the band, that's okay, push through mud. You're gonna pull nice and wide across your chest, squeeze those shoulder blades together. And then you're gonna pull in a diagonal fashion, one direction, and then opposite diagonal in the other direction. And you can start to feel those muscles of your shoulder blades start to light up. Good. And now if you're performing this without the bands, same thing, you're just pushing that mud out of the way in both directions. And you can see how any movement can become a resisted movement if you put intention to it, okay? I'll give you just a couple more seconds to practice that one. Very simple. Good work. And then the next one, so still in our uh, pull category here, Andrew's performing a three point row. So you can see there's three points of contact with the, the ground or a surface. So I want you to find something that you can put your hand on. And if you can't find anything, that's okay. You can use your knee, okay? So you can be in more of a, a position similar to this where you're just resting on your knee. Now this motion looks a lot like starting a lawnmower, right? And that's exactly what we're doing. His back stays nice and flat. This is where I want you to pull in that laundry detergent container again. Do you see how versatile this laundry detergent container is? You could use this for a lot. And if you save them all, you could have varying different weights. There's no sense investing in things that you can find around your house. You're only limited by your own creativity, right? 
All right, so on this three point row, we're gonna try six on each side and I'll let you work through those, okay? Now when Andrew pulls up, same thing, this mimics that pull up or that push up position pretty closely, where his elbow shaves his ribs, stays nice and tight, elbow comes up behind his back and then lowers down nice and slowly. I hope I'm giving you guys enough time to practice through these. <laughs> For the, for the sake of time here, I'll go ahead and move on to the next one because I want to make sure to get to all those amazing questions that you guys have. All right, so our next, uh, our next movement is the lunge. And this is a pretty common one that we see uh, uh, in day-to-day -day life. So Tanya to the right here is practicing getting down and up from the ground. And this is a skill that every single patient that comes through our clinic uh, begins to work on. Because if you happen to find yourself on the ground unexpectedly, we need to have resources to be able to get ourselves back up, okay? Um, so typically what I would recommend is crawling over to something and pulling yourself up onto it, okay? If you can manage that. If you can't manage that, boy, is that a great opportunity for some therapy as well, okay? get you nice and strong and get you nice and safe. So the lunge develops the mobility portion of your lower limb exercises. It starts to bring in more foot and ankle and knee and hip mobility. And while you won't load them up as much as some of your double leg movements, like your squats, your hinges, uh, when done correctly, they can significantly improve your numbers on some of those other lifts. Not only that, but it improves your balance with walking and running as well. Um, all lunge motions are inherently single leg. And so this is a great movement to assess side to side balance and strength. Real life application, picking something up off the floor if you have tight hamstrings, up and down stairs, especially if you take them in doubles with that reciprocal pattern, that's a great lunge pattern and getting down and up from the floor. So now the variation that Andrew is working on right here is called a split squat. So that's the one that we're gonna practice today. So I want everybody to take about uh, a good step away from uh, about their hips. So you're gonna step forward with a big step and then put that back leg behind you, okay? Now this movement, you can see his knee is coming over his toe just ever so slightly, but what I focus on is the back leg. So what I want you to do is drop your back knee down, straight down to the ground so your chest stays up nice and tall. Most of your weight should be in the front foot, kind of driving through our heel. And that back leg's just really there for some stability. So go ahead, I want you to practice about six on each side. You should have already practiced one or two on this side here. Now, again, it's okay for those knees to go over your toes. Happens every time we go downstairs, every time we sit down on the toilet. <laughs> Lunging is some of my favorite exercises to do. Builds really, really great quad strength, glute strength, something that we all tend to lack just a little bit of being desk sitters. <laughs> All right, six on each side. Well done, you guys. Your legs should be shaken by now. All right, last but not least, let's go over our carry. So what Andrew's gonna demonstrate is a simple farmer's carry. <clears throat> and you can see he's got some pretty big kettlebells over there. He's worked into this weight though. He's a pretty strong guy. Turk on the right over here, he just went on a grocery shopping trip. So he's picking up those grocery bags and carrying them into the house. This is probably the most straightforward exercise to see how it fits into our day. And the, uh, the carry is the epitome of a functional movement. Think grocery shopping, taking the trash out, walking, running. And again, walking and running is something that we sometimes take for granted as humans. Almost everyone does it daily, but it's a complex interaction between single leg strength, stability, coordination, and integration. The trunk needs to integrate the, the lower body with the upper body and what it's carrying. The leg needs to be stable enough and robust enough to hold us up when we're advancing that other leg forward. And we need the coordination to make sure that we don't trip over our own two feet, right? So I won't make you uh, demonstrate this one here, but you can see how this can be very uh, helpful and how you could do this often throughout your day, even in a work setting. Um, carry some heavy things down a hallway a couple of times, okay? I love me some carries. All different kinds of variations here too. So you can, you don't have to carry them by your side. You can carry them at your chest here, carry them overhead. All require just a little bit of different uh, energy there. 
All right. So well done, crew. Now that you have a solid bit of competence and confidence in the six common and necessary movement patterns, uh, all you need to provide is the consistency. <clears throat> now I'll send along a resource page as well, equipped with the words and articles on how to complete the rest of your interactive worksheet that I sent for you. Because while all the component pieces are helpful in creating the consistency, your why and your ability to create amazing goals also, which you'll find on your worksheet, um, is crucial to creating long-term success and adherence. So by now, I hope everyone has caught their breath and rehydrated. I want you to take notice of your body. Do you feel that little burst of energy? Maybe you feel a little weak in the knees or a little shaky. This all means that exercise is working. And while I expect my ears to be ringing tomorrow as you perhaps curse my name just a little bit, uh, I'll know that it's all with love and appreciation. <laughs> so thank you for participating. Thank you Rhonda and the Mesa team for inviting me to talk with you today. Uh, I hope you're all on your way to becoming optimal humans and perhaps needing that Mesa insurance just a little bit less. At this point, I'd like to open up the discussion to any questions that you might have. Um, try to keep them general enough that I can address the whole audience, but I'm also happy to pass along my email address for those that might have more um, specific questions, okay? So thank you so much for listening and for participating. My email address you can find right on that very last slide, okay? Let me... I'm looking through the chat as well. I'm not yeah. seeing any questions. Any questions? I know I want to start trying to get deeper in my squat. Is, are there any suggestions to open up my hips more? Absolutely. So actually, there's a lot of hip mobility drills. And if you follow our, uh, our page on Facebook, um, we provide monthly mobility challenges for our patients and for our tribe members is what we call it. And uh, last month, our, our, our mobility challenge was a hip mobility. And it was basically sitting in whatever the lowest depth of your squat would be with a little assistance underneath of you, um, but maybe not using it if you can avoid it. If you can get down to the bottom of that squat, the best way to get better at something is to do that something, okay? So uh, what I'll say is depending on where the restrictions coming from in the hip, uh, some hip mobility drills would be really, really helpful. That's a great idea too, because I, I know um, some of the people in this space may be trying to think of activities to do or challenges. We can do a hip mobility challenge and just go to your website and get some, some tips and use that. So definitely. Yeah, you get to see Andrew a little bit more in there too. <laughs> yeah. And um, Kathy has put that link in the chat room. Thank you so much, Dr. Amber. Um, I'm going to incorporate the six fundamental movements. I think I've been doing them kind of, uh, but I didn't know um, I was doing them. <laughs> but well, I've been incorporating them in my workout. So I, I, I feel better about doing everything I'm doing now. Definitely. Good job, Rob. Keep it up. You oh, awesome. so how often should we do these movements? So <clears throat> as long as we're getting that 150 to 300 minutes a week, doesn't necessarily matter how you break those up. But what I would say is some intentional form of movement every single day. Sometimes intentional movement though is, is a leisurely walk, right? Sometimes we need to decompress and just take our, our system down a little bit. Uh, exercise can help with that as you learned from Heidi. Um, but sometimes uh, exercise, exercise itself is stress, right? So sometimes it adds to the equation. So it really depends on what you need for your body, your stress levels, uh, where you're at in life at this particular moment. But what I would say, Becky, is the challenges every single day. So now it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to get to the gym every single day though, okay? I gave you lots of tools that you can be successful around your house um, you can, uh, I, I used to tell patients all the time that, you know, I don't go to the gym every single day, but I have one of the cleanest houses on the block because I run around my house, like a crazy person vacuuming. And I lunge with every vacuum, uh, brush that I take. And I squat down, you know, when I'm putting dishes away 10 times for each dish that I put away. So you can sneak it in. No excuses. <laughs> Great information. Great information. Any more questions out there? Yes, I would love to answer them. Hi, I'm just wondering, um, this whole presentation is being recorded. Are we gonna be able to share it with our membership then and they could view that same segment or what, how, like, is, well, is that possible or no? What you can do, Christy, um, it'll be on our YouTube channel. So everybody's used to bringing things up on the screen. You can bring it up on the screen during an association meeting, a staff meeting or a group activity. That's what we have them out there for. Thank you. 
Absolutely. I know I went over a lot today too. So I'm hoping that you might go back and rewatch some of those movements and really give yourself a chance to practice. Practice makes perfect, right? 